So, we are now at HMS Repulse, which was a fun video. I have to admit, it was a really fun video to do. It was a really interesting video in terms of Repulse because when you looked at her in Key Series 1, I think it's Episode 9, Ship 9, the amount of people who were expecting when they saw Repulse me to be talking about the World War One, World War Two vessel. And then I went, it's the 1892 one. Yeah. It's got a really interesting career. It ha did some really cool things. And it seemed worthwhile to do. I was also going to do the earlier Renown. Because, let's be honest, Renown and Repulse are two of Fisher's favourite names. He has a... He, he really fights because when they wanted to do the R class battle cruisers, when they were converting them, there are people who wanted to change their names. And Fisher fought hard to not change their names. Which is sensible because they're good names. Right. Uh, as usual now, starting from the top because I want to expand this out. Um, Nick Vorden, 58928. Pre Vanguard sounds good. Imagine telling someone from the US that I was really just pre-Vanguards. <laughs> I know. This is why I have a problem with pre-Dreadnought. It's the, the Key Ship series was really me beginning my um, whole campaign against pre-Dreadnought as a designation. I hate it. It doesn't, doesn't work. It's ahistorical. In that, whilst people were calling it quickly in World War I, we're using it. That's, that's not really a justification in my mind. A friend on it. Radar fire, 10, 12 inch gun, 10 inch, 12, 12 inch guns, although no means quick firing, will certainly not outperform 13 and a half inch, particularly when the loading machinery is not capable as it would come. Hit harder, hit first, and keep hitting? No. Thank you for the video. Exploder, uh, Dr. Clark, enjoyed it very much as always. Thank you. Radar fire at the time was n was near enough identical. A 13 and a half inch packed a bigger punch. That's the, the thing. It actually comes down to speed of construction. 12-inch guns and turrets were ready to go, thanks to Lord Nelson. This is for the Dreadnought, uh, for uh, for uh, HMS Dreadnought. And Jack Fisher didn't want to wait for anything as it being first as such a powerful statement. That is the thing. At the time, 13.5-inch guns, their mechanisms work rough, exactly, pretty much the same. And it's one of those other options. There are lots of options to discuss when we're talking about Dreadnoughts and Dreadnought herself. I think I've said in several videos that she is probably the most conservative Great Leap Forward ever achieved. In that they are making this jump on this big thing and she, thanks to World War One, you get Dreadnoughts and Pre-Dreadnoughts becoming a type which really confirms her in her status. And yet, honestly, the British even off the shelf could have gone for something more powerful. If they had been prepared, and if you look... I'm going to be doing recording soon. In fact, I'm recording. It's going to be the first episode of Key Ship Series Seven. If you consider the Dante Alighieri, which is the next competition, really, to Dreadnought, that is, if that had come first, we wouldn't be talking about Dreadnoughts, and the Royal Navy would be forced to redesign to catch up. That's a problem. It doesn't come first. But the Royal Navy could very easily have done something better. They could very easily. There are 13 half inch guns, there are 14 inch guns on the shelf. There are triple turrets on the shelf. Super firing. Fisher always claimed he didn't realize it was possible, so that's why he didn't put it through. But you also find that there were naval constructors and architects telling him they could do it. And he wasn't listening to them. So you could quite easily have had a 15, 14-inch gun dreadnought. And it could have even been a 24 knotter. Because again, that was quite possible. And that's why I tend to ask those questions. Because the reasons they don't go that route, mostly boil down to speed, which means it comes down to the value of being first. And then you have to decide whether the, that was worth it or not. 
Now, when we start making that case, was it worthwhile being first versus waiting for those sort of things? You need to first work out what the other viable options were. This is where alternate history, counterfactual history, whatever you want to call it, really comes into its own. Because you can't decide whether they were making the best decision they could on the information available unless you explore what other things were actually viably available and which thing, and decide which things weren't viably available. Because sometimes people give you concepts and you go, that's just not possible. Um, I have this personal dream of her having 15-inch guns, but it's not possible. Dreadnought couldn't have had 15-inch guns. They're just, there isn't a viable 15-inch gun around at the time. The same with a 16 and a half inch. Which would be tempting, because let's be honest, there were 16 and a quarter inch on Victoria and Sans Parel. And so if you'd had 16 and a half inch guns around, that would have been really cool. But the fact is, no one had been working on them. They had been working on 13 and a half inch, they had been working on 14 inch, they did have guns. Ellsworth Ordnance Company had a 14 inch 45 caliber available. Canuckled. So would post ironclad or evolved ironclad be a better terms? Potentially, but what I've gone with is ironclad, steam, steam battleships, uh, because basically the defining quality is steam, and then sovereign style. Uh, I'm, I'm still trying to work out whether we could, that there's something better than steam in there, and people are coming with ideas, and I, I do like that. Um, turreted ironclad battleship. A turreted battleship is was, temp was is a tempting one because the defining quality of those ships prior to the sovereign class, but prior to uh, but after the ironclad frigates is their turrets. Are their turrets? So it could be turreted battleships. Okay, Michael Hooch, I think to get your question, your your comment on, I'm going to have to shrink this, but I'm also going to s start it because I've forgotten to do that. I have to admit that referring to dreadnoughts, uh, the three dreadnoughts as Royal Sovereigns doesn't sit right me. The Royal Sovereigns were barbette ships with many, most of the later PDs were, tar uh, uh, were turreted ships. It also confused me the, to refer, for example, Atrus Canopus as a Royal Sovereign when she is a completely different class. So what do you call them then? Well, actually, the thing is, it's during the Royal Sovereigns that they transition from barbettes to turrets. So that's why we're the Royal Sovereign class. Uh, so what do you call them then? As if you say, history naming should be looking forward, so they can't be pre-drawn. My answer is that to us, what did company both Nailos and Layman call them out there? And they refer to them as battleships. Yes... They always refer to me, then that's the way that the contemporaries refer to dreadnoughts as battleships. If you look at naval officers, they refer to all of them just as battleships. They don't know it. The classifications are for historians and people looking back. The classifications are never really for the contemporaries. Or other than newspapers in World War One. So you're proposing ironclads. That's a lot of divisions. Steelclads. Battleships. You've got pre dreadnoughts in there again, and dreadnoughts. That doesn't really work. But it's a nice idea. I can see where you're coming from, but steel clads? No. There is lots of times a transition where you've got both iron and steel, and there are some more fun things as well they try. Uh, so I, I can see where you're coming from, but the armor designation is... It's a difficult one to pull off. It's a difficult one to work through because of the varieties of armor and because of the combinations of armor. I've already I did a key ship recently. Was that a key ship? No, it was the Battle of Tsushima video. And the Russians have both Harvey and Krupp armor on a ship, and they've made the belt out of out of um, Harvey. And there were ships which literally had steel turrets and iron armor belts. I think for which navy? Might have been the Russians again, or might have been the Chinese. But it's just that's the problem. Armor is so many people mucking around with weird stuff. Mike, I use the uh, take a drink pause interview in, in, in interviews too. It's a useful tip. Yeah, 
it's a good way to allow people to think, uh, have time to think, but it's also a good way to allow yourself time to think. And so I probably prefer the type, uh, name Sovereign Type over all Sovereign Type. Not a huge difference, but it sounds a little less clunky to me. Agreed. Thank you, George Hughes. Philip Dupper 4672. Asking a French not to be annoying? Not going to happen. Ah, but uh, it's not be like the French asking the British not to be annoying. Just wouldn't happen as well. Paul Ricardo, since you asked, calling a vessel a Royal Sovereign Type, applying that as a descriptor, increases the bar of entry for amateur naval users. I don't think that's who you are as a historian. pre drawn is a better term as everyone knows it. But it's still incorrect. So that's the thing. I can see where you're coming from, but it's incorrect. So it bugs the life out of me. It's a personal bug, Baron. It's a personal crusade. I doubt I will ever win. That's why I'm calling it a personal crusade. <laughs> but... No, it, it just I do not like them being called pre arts. I just don't like something being named to something it doesn't even know is coming. It'd be like calling my sister a pre-Alex. Be rude to her. Just wouldn't do that. So, Clark, was it her rate of fire or less a number of men that he, he preferred were renowned than the first rates? It's... To be honest, it's a combination of all those things, but also it's her adaptability. He liked renown. I've always heard that it was the speed and maneuverability of renown he liked, but perhaps there are other things as well. Lots of things. Basically, renown was his perfect ship as far as, he, as Jackie Fisher was concerned. Zogar, famous last words. In roughly 20 minutes. Look, I'm keeping the common responses to roughly 20 minutes because of the number of comments. Um, Paul from Chicago. I think a clever commander in chief Mediterranean has a tendency to choose the best ships for being an admiral and not the best at fighting, like that large underprotected cruiser. A British commander in chief Mediterranean from of the long 19th century shouldn't worry themselves of prestige. They are the hype. There is a certain advantage to that. If you consider certain periods, the admiral is, has enough status; it doesn't matter what they turn up on. They can afford to turn up in something which is a bit of a clangor or less than powerful. But the thing I would say about Renown is she's a sort of second-class battleship, but she's not a second-class battleship. Because when I was comparing her in mentally to the Russian second-class battleship, it's a case of there are second-class battleships and there are second-class battleships in this world. There are the ones the Russians are building, called class, which should not be allowed anywhere near combat. And there is Renown, which is second-class because she's slightly lighter. But they haven't made, they haven't changed the quality of the materials they're putting into her. They have just made her lighter. Tender mm -hmm. As the family axe had a joint where the head and the shaft met, this joint must have remained the same shape to fulfill the same function. Hmm. To a broad extent it has, but I think it has changed a little over time. Similarly, all the Mark 41 Villas through the years must be usable in all versions and in all ships. <coughs> oh, oh, you nice and hopeful person. Broadly speaking, but they need to have been updated. Any chance of a fancy edition with leather and gold lettering for expanded third edition? I have first edition, but would definitely buy a fancy third edition if you have them printed. That book. And we can always hope. Matthew Keeling. Shockingly, Admiral Fisher preferred to keep his flag on the faster ship intended for killing cruisers. Who would have guessed? The ships of this period might be the best ones to call steam battleships than previous ones, uh, being ironclad battleships. The French certainly not uh, not patenting on the Royal Sovereigns, after all. Uh, not sure what they were patenting after. Paris down as this. That is the problem of calling them sovereigns. The here are sovereign battleships because of the French. It is always the French who cause me trouble. But they were definitely were part of the period's developments. Due to the three body issues, Hood might be better considered the last of the old style battleships, whatever you call them, rather than the potential starting point for the next period. I throw it back if you will. But from Gla Chicago, Steve, Steve Battleships is pre Gloire. Hmm. Took some. But they're steam wooden battleships, and they're steamships of line. As Bishop says, a steam wooden battleship. Uh, 
Bonjour, Matthew. If you can pick up a copy of Andrew Lambert's Battles and Transi uh, Battleships and Tra Transitions, it covers the steamship transition pre Quant Law better prepared than ever in every book. It's absolutely fascinating read. I will concur with that. I have somewhere around here my copy. He says. Somewhere around here I do have my copy. Have you moved my copy? Oh, there it is. I will say this, if you leave shirts at home and you make a rapid order from Amazon, make sure you click on the exact right size, because otherwise it comes and you're sort of going, hey, it's good enough for going around houses. Battleships and Traditions by Andrew Lambert. It's a good, really good and really useful book. And I'll be doing, I've reviewed it many times in uh, brew ships, but definitely will have done it on brew ships on the uh, 26th of November, 2023. I think again, not much disposable income moment, but I have put that one on list to get. pre while steamships and line are exactly that. Ships and line have, been, have integrated steam power. There is a need to differentiate them from the more modern style of battleship, as the role is somewhat different. Thus retained one of the names from the ship, such ship's line. Line of battleship, ship and line, ray tech. We just call them steam ships and line. Uh, the pre dreadnought type ships are the steam battleship coming to its own, but are not yet more specialised subgroup that is classified by HMS Dreadnought. Hence, steam battleships make the most sense for these ships. Please note, before you think that's me making weird noises, I have a poodle who's demanding patting with medicines next to me. That is, of course, the fluffy research assistant. Ella, yes, you got your patting with menaces. There's not many questions more, and then I'll take you. How's that sound? Another one. I don't know, Match of Dostal, six months ago. Um, I think that term pre not has its merits once you get into World War One, because in my mind it could categorize these ship the battleships as a distinct group easily. But you're right, before that it doesn't make sense to call them the pre uh, the P word. Mm-hmm. Fred's and Ford. I don't know about anyone else, but I refer to all existing previous vessels as pre-warp drive vessels. Technically correct, the best kind of correct. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're obviously a Dracula viewer, you, and I agree completely. Although I tend to wind him up them. Uh, while, while Bill Cox, I offer two sides of the Battleship Temporal Coin for your consideration. Pre and post Bismarck. <laughs> uh, La Free Bill, if nothing else, a ship can still be used to help train crews. A vital role in any navy. As even a cursory glance at history will soon show. Also, I can certainly get behind referring to the pre drones as Royal Sovereign types from this point on as well. Thank you. Uh, Blackburn, it's a bit unfortunate the British didn't stick with the 16.5 inch gun nail gun. If they had simply upgraded their infrastructure to allow for a larger ship, it would have been hard for them to build a ship with two twin 16.5 inch turrets. It would probably have then allowed for the later 8 and 9.2 inch guns to be made more viable on battleships, as splashes between them would have been more easily distinguished from the opposed to later 12 inch guns. Also, it would have been funny to see Adrian's dreadnought size, uh, see Adrian's dreadnought size to handle a similar amount of guns in 16.5 inch. Oh, at that point, you have to go triple turrets. Probably 12. Four triple turrets, sixteen and a half inch guns. Oh, might end up looking the closer to Dante Alighieri. Eric Kaufman, uh, uh, someone who has lectured on the university and peer conference level as well. I just realised I'm lucky enough to have stumbled upon having a drink during a talk, apparently by complete accident. Excellent, point taken, appreciated. It's a trick. It allows people time to catch up. It allows. You then to consider the point you've made. It's all sorts of things. I've covered this more in the previous video in response to the comments. Hello, hello. You're cute. Yes, this is the uh, this is the distraction I have going on next to me while I'm trying to work. Basically, going pat me. So if I see distracted, it's because he's literally just occasionally flicking his tail to go. Hello. Pat me. <laughs> oh, I love dogs. Right then. Oh. So. 
The whole pre dreadnought point, which I agree on, by the way, made me think, what do you do date wise? BC AD. I always found that funny when they are like in 4 BC, some road dude said this or that. That's so close to the zero point that it sounds silly. Well, if something is 3000 BC, it's because it becomes so abstract that I don't really care. It's just a big number. Maybe they should use the Roman year numbers for Roman votes. Makes things nice and confusing. <laughs> it is an interesting one. You need something date-wise to sort of sort out. You need to start sort of rewriting it all, but we translate dates. We do translate dates into our own date and dating system. But still, I don't like that. I, I, I have to say, I do use BC and AD because sometimes some of my stuff, believe it or not, does go into BC. Um, a lot of the Roman stuff, of course, goes into BC, but some stuff even goes further into BC. And yet, that makes more sense to me than pre dreadnought. Captain Nemo. And I should mention Heishamench, excellent argument, thank you. Uh, Captain Nemo. Ah, yes, the great calendar, which is always consistent and changes people, change their minds. Yes. And then Lewis, uh, Fredson's Ford. Lewis C.K. is a funny pit about counting down in BC, BC times. People in those times freaking out, what's going to happen at zero? Kind of like what we are people doing, freaking out about the Millennium Bug. Uh, Quizmaster Law, although, to be fair, let me point it out. The Millennium Bug could have been a real problem, but a lot of people did a lot of work to prevent it being a problem. Mostly because some people have been really interestingly short-sighted when programming in computer systems. And some of those computers were the funds, ones which we just relied on keep functioning and that no one really thought about. I feel the disturbance in the force as if a thousand voices had shouted out all at once in real IRM and then all went black and silent. Hmm. Jacob, 20 minutes roughly. Me looks down and time goes, 40 minutes. Oh well, more to enjoy. <laughs> yeah, lubrication was like. I know you're a historian, but how about the term prehistoric? It's always bugged me. I, but basically, it exists because some archaeologists and many historians like to try to draw lines in the sand and basically decide that history is what where we've got stories that have been passed down and anything before that is prehistoric. Is it not just the time before any written records remain for historians to read? The trouble with that is it presumes that all historians do is read records of the same history. And we haven't been so limited ever, really. There's always been oral history. There's always been things going around. And sometimes the oral history is now written down later on. And sometimes we're interpreting from archaeology. And if you consider me, okay, I do a lot of archaeology. But most of my archaeological work, which is considered under the archaeological branch of history, is called, I would always be known as forensic engineering where we haven't got the plans of things and I'm taking something apart to try and work out what how it works and how it gets put together again and how it you know was operated and made but that's considered under archaeology but we haven't got and we've got oral records of people who operated it we have got the actual thing we don't have the written documents because they've been deleted by some person who's gone well we don't need to keep these and pop them in a bonfire someone else will keep their copy and then we can you know just burn it and save on the storage costs and so no one's got it. Well, that's a sort of archaeology, area of history, forensic engineering. It's, it's a great combination of different things, and it's all history. So if you're going to use the rule of written, we're just using written records, then you're, incredible, you're limiting history. So if history is not limited that way, you can't then deliver it time-wise and go, well, when written records. And also, we keep. What do you consider wall uh, cave paintings? Do you consider them formal re written records? Because they are made by hand, and some of the writing looks very much like pictography uh, in some of the other uh, sort of other stuff we're doing. So, what about cave paintings? It just. I don't like prehistoric. I don't like uh, anything like that. Well, well, Cox, Matilda doing Chromie on your t-shirt? How very terrestrial. I like my t-shirt, my tanky t-shirt. I have managed to get a warship t-shirt like it, though. I keep looking for one. 
Well, Bill Cox, Pepsi has long been a sweet monkey on my historian's back. Uh, I normally have too much blood in my Pepsi stream. <laughs> and Felix, we'll first. Cool. All right, and thank you very much for watching, and I hope you're enjoying this sort of series, this comment response series. This was the lovely HMS Repulse from 1892. She was a fun ship. Thank you very much for watching, and take care. I'm going to now walk the poodle. <laughs> Who's very happy at that fault. <sighs> You're complaining already. I'm, I'm going to take you. Just let it time down. So we have the full 20 seconds for the um, things at the end.